Right view is all about the power of action. To create pleasure, to create pain. And ultimately to find a way beyond all pain. And so when you adopt right view, you realize it's, it tells you a lot about how you have to act. You can't just sit there and say, I believe, and leave it at that. It forces you to take a good, long, hard look at your actions to see what, to what extent you are acting skillfully, unskillfully. And you realize you need to motivate yourself to act skillfully because the mind that hasn't been trained is a mixture of all kinds of things. Skillful intentions, unskillful intentions, leading in all directions. And you realize you don't want to go in all directions. There's one direction you want to go is to the end of suffering. That's why right view leads to right resolve. The resolve to straighten out your intentions. Because you realize that's the only way you're going to put an end to suffering, is by getting a handle on your acts. And your acts come from what? They come from your thoughts. Which kind of thoughts do you feed in the mind? Which ones do you not feed? Which ones do you encourage? Which ones do you keep in check? There's a sutta, Majjhima 19, where the Buddha talks about this. Now you realize that some thoughts, based on sensuality, based on ill will, and based on harmfulness, are going to lead you to do harmful things. So you keep them in check. The same way that a cowherd, during the rainy season when the cows could get into the cro crops, beat on the rice, create a lot of trouble. You've got to make sure they don't get into the rice fields. So you have to beat them and curb them and check them. As for thoughts that are based on renunciation, freedom from ill will, freedom from harmfulness, those are thoughts that you allow. You actually encourage them. Because these are the ones that are going to provide the motivation to act in skillful ways, to speak in skillful ways, to think in skillful ways. And so you encourage them. At the very least, you don't have to keep them in check. You realize they won't do any harm. This is like the cowherd. After the crops have been gathered, and the cows can pretty much wander anywhere they want. They're not going to get into trouble. And they're going to try to feed off the crops because there's no crops there to feed off. So they can wander around, and all you have to do is sit under the tree and remember there are cows out there. So when the time comes, you take them back to the pen. The same way you can be aware of your skillful thoughts, and you don't have to worry about where they're going to take you. But you do have to remember that you are thinking. And there comes a point where thinking just wears the mind down. This is how the mind gets inclined and in concentration. You need a place for the mind to rest. And it's in this way that mundane right resolve develops into transcendent right resolve. It's a very clear connection between right resolve and concentration. Because after all, what is concentration? The mind is firmly set on one object. And how does it get set there? Well, you have to set it there through your intentions. You have to motivate yourself to do this. The mind doesn't just come to concentration in a stable way. It can every now and then fall into concentration. But when you leave it, you haven't developed a skill. It was just kind of hit or miss. What you want is something that's more skillful, something that's more deliberate, something where you know where you want the mind to be, and you can get it there, and you can keep it there. That requires an intention. So it's right resolve builds on right view and leads to all the other factors of the path. But at the same time, it also improves right view. As the Buddha said, there are three levels of discernment. There's a discernment that comes from hearing, there's a discernment that comes from listening, and there's a discernment that comes from putting things into practice. And when you start out with right view and you say, well, it can make sense, 
what the Buddha says about action, what he says about the causes of suffering and the end of suffering. That's discernment simply on the level of hearing and thinking. But as you implement that right view, you're going to learn an awful lot about the mind. You learn a lot more about action as you struggle with the mind's tendency to want to act in unskillful ways, or its laziness around acting in skillful ways. To begin with, you begin to realize there's a dialogue going on in the mind. Thoughts come up out of your past actions. And there's a dialogue about whether to go with them or not. This is where we talk about the committee of the mind. Because just because something appears in the mind doesn't mean that it's something you want to follow with, that you want to pursue. You've got to examine it. Where is this thought going to lead? This is what right resolve is all about, looking at where the thoughts lead. In fact, the Buddha said this is one of the points where he got on the path, realizing that he should divide his thoughts into two based on where they went, where they came from, where they went. Not so much their content, but what if I pursue this thought, where is it going to lead me? If I think in these ways, where am I going to where am I going to go? What is it going to make me do? What is it going to make me say? So the ability to step back is an important part of understanding your mind. Before you can keep a thought into check, you have to be able to look at it. And so you begin to realize there are lots of different voices in the mind that you've really got to sort out. But simply because they appear there doesn't mean that you're committed to them. And this gives you greater insight into the principle of karma. The thoughts that appear there, that's, they're the result of old karma. But what you do with them right now, that's new karma. Because this is one of the important aspects of the Buddhist teachings on karma. Is not, not everything is determined from the past. People may have done things to you, and of course, as a result, you're having done things to somebody in the past. If you try to trace it back, you don't know how far it's going to go. It can go on and on and on to the point where you begin to forget I mean, who started it. And you have to realize it doesn't matter. What matters is what you're doing with those tendencies right now. You have the freedom of choice in the present moment. This is the important part of the Buddhist teachings on karma. People at that time either didn't teach karma at all or said that you were totally determined in what you were going to do or say, either from something outside or from your own actions. And that was the Buddha who said, no, you have this choice right here in the present moment. So this is one of the important lessons that Right Resolve teaches your right view, that this freedom of choice really is real. You really can make a difference in your mind. If you keep sticking with that decision that right now I'm going to go with whatever is skillful, I'm going to abandon whatever is unskillful. In the beginning it may be an uphill battle, but after all you begin to realize you get more and more of a handle on your own mind. That's one of the lessons. And then as you deal specifically with each of the types of right resolve, you gain more lessons in right view as well, in terms of the resolve on renunciation. You have to do battle with lust. One of the standard ways of doing that is to go through the contemplation of the 32 parts of the body. And you find that it takes care of some of your lust, but you begin to realize that the problem is not so much with the object out there, it's with the mind's attitude in here. It dresses things up because it wants something to lust for. And you have to strip away all that dressing up to see what's there. And the body has its attractive aspects, but it has a lot of unattractive aspects. And you begin to realize the whole problem is with perception. And the perception, of course, again, is used for a purpose. There's something in the mind that wants to get lustful. Other times there'll be parts of the mind that want to get away from lust. And they'll use the perceptions in line with their wants. And so you learn about the power.
power of perception. As the Buddha said, it's a mental fabrication. It shapes your mind. And it, in turn, is shaped by the dialogue going on in the mind about what you want, what you don't want. You begin to see all these processes of what the Buddha calls fabrication here in the present moment. And so as you try to overcome your lust, you learn more and more about what goes into lust, what the real causes are, and what the simple excuses are. The idea that something is desirable, beautiful, attractive, that's the excuse. The real cause lies inside. This is another lesson that your right resolve teaches to right view. As for non-ill will and harmlessness, ill will is the opposite of good will, Harmless, harmfulness is the opposite of compassion. This is where you bring in the contemplations of infinite good will, infinite compassion. This, too, teaches you a lot of lessons as you try to give rise to these states in the mind. You see, see that they depend on all three kinds of fabrication. There's bodily fabrication, the way you breathe, verbal fabrication, the way you direct your thoughts to a topic, in this case goodwill, and the way you think about it. And you realize you've got to think about this. It's, goodwill is not something that just naturally is there in the mind and you're simply going to uncover it. It's got to be developed. As the Buddha said, it's a determination. It's something you have to keep in mind that you're going to be determined to stick with goodwill. And you've got to keep fabricating the state. And although you may find it natural to feel goodwill for some people, there are a lot of people out there for whom it's very hard to feel goodwill. And with that, you've got to work. You've got to remind yourself of what goodwill means. It means a desire for happiness. And where does happiness come from? It comes from actions. So if you're wishing for someone else to be happy, you're also wishing for them to be skillful in their actions. It's not that you just wave a magic wand and touch them on the head and it makes them happy. They have to create the causes for happiness themselves. And you realize, even with people who have been very cruel, people who have been very harmful, if you have a wish of goodwill for them, you're basically saying, may they change their ways. May they realize the error of their ways and learn to act in a skillful way. And you ask yourself, is there anybody out there for whom you cannot wish that? Well, there may be some people who say, I would like to see them squirm a little bit. I would like to see them suffer a little bit before they find true happiness. What is gained by that thought? Often when people squirm and are unhappy, that makes them more and more likely to act in unskillful ways. So if someone is able to change their ways, you should be happy for them, regardless of what they've done in the past. That way you can apply the same thought to yourself. In other words, if you want everybody to be punished for their bad deeds before they find happiness, then you have to apply the same principle to yourself. But if you are happy for their ability to act in ways that are skillful, that means that you're free to act in ways that are skillful. You can be happy about that. As for people who are suffering or doing things that are unskillful, It's simply an extension of goodwill. These are all lessons that come back and augment your right view. It becomes the right view that is based on practice, based on developing good qualities of the mind. Right view interacts with all the factors of the path in this way. It provides them with a rationale, and then they provide it with more detailed understanding exactly how fabrication works in the mind, how your actions in the present moment shape your experience. Then you really are in a position to shape your experience in a good direction. It's regardless of the raw material that's coming in from the past. You can be resolved on acting in a skillful way. You can be resolved on being on the path. Remember that the Buddha didn't teach the path only to people who deserve to put an end to suffering. He taught it for everybody. Everybody realizes that they are causing their suffering. They're sick and tired of blaming it on other people because that goes nowhere. 
the Acharya Vrta, what can they do so they don't have to suffer? And to whatever extent they've been causing suffering for themselves or others in the past, that's not the issue. You can change your ways. So it's in this way that right view grows as you practice the path. You gain a greater understanding of karma, you get a greater understanding of fabrication. You gain a greater understanding of what exactly is skillful and what's not skillful. This is how the practice of the path fleshes out your right view, and how all the factors of the path begin to coalesce. Because this is when they all come together, that's when you begin to see the Dharma. You gain the Dharma eye. which is illuminated by all the factors of the path coming together.